Okay, well, uh, it's a great <coughs> pleasure to uh, welcome Quinton Dealey to give a, a seminar today. Quinton's known to very many of you. Uh, he's a senior lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, or the IOP as we know it, uh, and the Maudsley. He's been here for many years and um, has had a long standing interest in the group, the Maudsley Philosophy Group. He's now uh, a trustee and um, has been so talking to us about uh, sort of wider cultural anthropological aspects of psychiatry for years. So it's uh, um, great to have an opportunity to hear, hear you speak about witchcraft and psychosis. So you're going to tell us how you're going to structure the, the seminar. I'll leave that to you. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I think Hello. Fine. So I think we're finally settling down and composing ourselves. So essentially, I am going to uh, present from a, uh, a paper. Um, and part of the reason that I'm doing that is that, in a way, what we're doing today, inevitably, in talking about a topic which is of interest to psychiatry and neuroscience, and talking about a topic which is of interest to the humanities, we're combining two different forms of scholarship. And in, t in talking about witchcraft in particular, I'm reliant upon the work of social anthropologists and historians, and therefore I'm going to use external quotation uh, in order to define the phenomena that we're talking about. So I'm going to present this as a paper, although there will be some PowerPoint slides to prevent withdrawal symptoms from the more scientifically inclined amongst us. So in his book, Witchcraft, Intimacy and Trust, the Dutch social anthropologist Peter Gessier, uh, who's worked among the Maka people, of southwestern Cameroon since the early 1970s, relates the story of Jean Ebert. <coughs> Ebert was a successful functionnaire, a civil servant and political operative, who in the late 1960s returned to his village. So Gessier says, Ebert felt ill. His complaints were quite mysterious, general fatigue, and no doctor succeeded in curing him. So people soon started whispering about witchcraft, Apparently, Ebba himself shared this view despite his Western education. After some hesitation, he told me that he began to frequent one Unganga healer after another. Finally, an Unganga from Gem country, some 60 miles away, succeeded in helping him, but insisted that he had to leave the village and return to one of the urban centres of the east. Local people interpreted this as an attack from inside the house, in other words, an attack from his extended family, as a result of jealousy from relatives he had not sufficiently helped, although different <coughs> suspects and specific motives were identified. The local interpretation of Ebba's difficulties is only one example of a wide range of beliefs and practices called witchcraft in different cultures and periods of history. What all of these beliefs and practices share in common is the notion that affliction or misfortune can be intentionally caused by the special actions of a person, the witch. Yet psychiatrists and psychologists are also confronted with beliefs that misfortune has special types of personal causation. But the people who express these beliefs are considered to be suffering from paranoid delusions. In other words, unfounded but abnormally salient beliefs that others intend harm. Paranoid delusions include beliefs in witchcraft, along with a wide range of other notions of how harm can occur through the intentions and actions of a remote malefactor. So if both paranoid delusions and witchcraft involve attributions of harmful intent, this raises the question of how the phenomena are related and whether explanations of one can be informed by explanations of the other. In the case of paranoid delusions, biological and psychological models accept social influences on paranoia, but mainly emphasise the role of cognitive and neurobiological processes in the beliefs and actions of individuals. This raises the question of whether these levels of explanation are relevant to understanding witchcraft beliefs. I'll pause for a moment, actually. So this raises, uh, as we're talking about, so um, paranoia raises the question, well, can we apply those understandings to understand witchcraft, but also the other way around, 
uh, do the social and cultural explanations that have been developed to account for witchcraft phenomena? Can they be applied to psychosis? So let's start by thinking about what paranoia and delusions are. So the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association defined delusions as a false belief based on incorrect inference about external reality that is firmly held despite what almost everyone else believes and despite what constitutes incontrovertible and obvious proof or evidence to the contrary. DSM advises that the belief, it, it adds that the belief is not ordinarily accepted by other members of the person's culture or subculture. So, for example, it's not an article of religious faith. So critics have questioned the extent to which different aspects of this de definition can be unambiguously applied in a given case. In practice, it can be difficult to establish the falsity of the belief, the evidence for and against it, and the extent to which it would or would not be accepted by other members of the person's culture or social group. Nevertheless, the criteria contained in this definition of delusions remain central to diagnostic attempts to demonstrate that a belief is delusional. There are different types of delusion, some of which are particularly associated with a specific psychiatric disorder or related set of conditions, so grandiose delusions in the case of mania or delusions of guilt in the case of depression. In the case of persecutory delusions, so quoting from the influential definition of Wing in 1974, the subject believes that someone or some organisation um, or power is trying to harm him in some way, to damage his reputation, to cause him bodily injury, to drive him mad, or to bring about his death. As the psychologist Daniel Freeman put it, in persecutory delusions, the belief is that others deliberately intend to cause the harm. The term paranoia is commonly used to describe ideas of persecution and the related notion of ideas of reference in which coincidental or unrelated events are interpreted as having an important personal significance. So the term paranoia has been used to refer to all types of delusional thinking, to a distinct diagnosis and to general suspiciousness, but in the present context it's reference to unfounded beliefs that a persecutor is a deliberate intention to cause harm is most relevant. So a tradition of psychiatric thought, going back to the philosopher and psychiatrist Carl Jaspers, emphasises the difference between the differences between delusions and normal beliefs. So, for example, that unlike ordinary beliefs, delusions are held with abnormal conviction, unchanged by experience or argument, and often has bizarre or impossible content. So given the depth of change in belief during a delusion and associated changes in perception, feeling and action. The aspects hold that true delusions, in contrast to delusion-like ideas, are ununderstandable in the technical sense that they're inaccessible to empathy and therefore impossible to explain in terms of the patient's background or personality. Biological psychiatric research has attempted to understand factors distinguishing those at increased risk for severe mental disorder, such as schizophrenia, of which delusions typically <coughs> are a part. So here the ununderstandability of delusions is explained as a pathological feature of severe mental disorder. The puzzling question of how a person can come to believe the propositional content of a delusion is solved by viewing the content of the delusion and the person's intense belief in it as a byproduct of cognitive and biological processes that have gone deeply awry. Patients and their mental processes are clearly set apart from ordinary psychology in keeping with the disease model of causation. In this approach, for example, abnormalities of genes, transmitter systems, brain structure and function, influenced also by environmental insults, ranging from psychosocial stress to drug taking, motivate delusions as symptoms of schizophrenia or other mental illnesses. However, an alternative approach locates delusions and ordinary beliefs on a continuum. This implies that less severe forms of delusional ideas or delusion-like ideas should be present in the general population amongst people who do not come to the attention of psychiatrists. It also implies that processes contributing to belief formation in the general population are likely to contribute to the formation of delusions, 
So delusion should be intelligibly linked at the levels of both meaning and causation to ordinary beliefs. So however difficult it is to understand why a person can hold unfounded and sometimes bizarre beliefs with such conviction, it should be possible to identify steps linking delusional beliefs to more commonplace ideas and attitudes. So the continuum notion has been strongly emphasised in recent psychological research into delusion formation, much of which has focused on persecutory <coughs> delusions. The spectrum from persecutory ideation, ideation to frank delusions has been described as a paranoia hierarchy. So persecutory ideas may range from feelings of vulnerability or thoughts that the world is potentially dangerous through gradations to unshakable convictions of severe threat involving conspiracies which may be known to the wider public. So it is also been observed that there is a cultural sensitivity or variation to the content of delusions, of persecutory delusions. And in fact the susceptibility of some individuals to articulate a sense of threat through a variety of locally available notions has long been recognised. So as Richard Burton wrote in The Anatomy of Mel Melancholy in the early 17th century, and this of course is talking about melancholia, what we now call depression, he does not venture alone for fear he should meet the devil, a thief, be sick, fears old women as witches, and every black dog or act he sees, he suspects this to be a devil. Every person near him is maleficiated, every creature, all intent to harm him. Contemporary research in Western societies has shown associations between paranoia and a range of environmental factors such as poverty, poor physical health, lack of perceived social support, lack of social cohesion and problem drinking. But research principally led by clinical and cognitive psychologists has also sought to identify psychological causal influences on the emergence and maintenance of paranoid ideas. So these causes have been termed INUS conditions, and uh, since this is the Maudsley philosophy group, I thought I should put up this explanation, Freeman and Garrett's explanation, of what an INUS condition is, which dates from the Oxford analytic philosopher J.L. Mackey's book on causation in 1974. So an INUS condition is each cause that you identify for a complex psychiatric dis disorder in itself is insufficient but non-redundant part of an unnecessary but sufficient condition. In other words, you identify a range of causal factors, like a dim sum menu, a subset of which that you select are jointly sufficient to cause a particular psychiatric symptom. Um, but uh, each one by itself is insufficient and not, not neither sufficient nor necessary to cause a condition. So this is research on on causal factors. So what are these causal factors? So worry is relevant um, because, th so these are causal factors for paranoia, paranoid ideation, but actually also paranoid delusions. So worry is relevant because it maintains preoccupation with ideas of threat. Levels of worry predict the intensity and persistence of paranoia. Negative self-beliefs often derive from adverse experience of others when growing up contributes to a sense of inferiority and vulnerability. In turn, this lowers the threshold for perceiving threat. Anomalous experiences it encompass potentially wide-ranging disruptions in sensation, perception, and the normal sense and experience of selfhood associated with drug-taking, suggestive and dissociative processes, or psychotic states. The sense of anxiety and arousal attending such strange experiences tends to invite explanations in terms of threat posed by others. Poor sleep, such as insomnia, daytime sleep or nightmares, may maintain paranoia in several ways. For example, through negative emotions and worse regulation of mood, anomalous experiences and cognitive effects limiting concentration, flexibility of thought and motivation <coughs> needed to manage distressing ideas and experiences. Reasoning biases <coughs> refer to styles of reasoning that are more common in individuals with paranoia that reinforce interpretations that events reflect the harmful intent or actions of others. So, for example, patients with delusions show a lack of so-called belief flexibility, whereby they do not consider alternative explanations for misfortune compared to healthy individuals with control. Reduced data gathering 
leading to a jumping to conclusions reasoning style and reduced analytic reasoning are more common in patients with paranoid delusions and likely contribute to the maintenance of paranoid beliefs. And finally, safety-seeking behaviours refers to the defensive strategies such as avoidance of exposure to perceived threat. So while these behaviours reduce anxiety in the short term, they help to maintain unfounded beliefs by reducing exposure to evidence that would disconfirm them. So, for example, that encountering a sort of perceived threat does not result in harm. So the identif identification of these psychological factors uh, contributing to delusion formation raises the question of how these processes are related to brain processes involved in beliefs and delusions. So in fact, both the disease and the continuum models have converged on a similar body of findings relating to the biological underpinnings of delusion formation, but with differing emphases. So specifically, the mesolimbic dopamine system has been implicated in the biology of psychosis, delusions and hallucinations, for decades. So, as Miller put it in 1976, the process of acquiring the associations necessary for learning a conditioned response in an experimental animal depends on the presence of dopamine. In human schizophrenic patients, an excessive supply of cerebral dopamine may facilitate the acquisition of associations between units of information to the point where unrelated features are associated and treated as if they are meaningful combinations. This process can be terminated by administering dopamine antagonists. So that is an, an early articulation of the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, and some version or other of that idea has, has persisted since then. It, with developments, of course. So a, an influential recent formulation is the work of Shittish uh, Kapoor in his account of psychosis as a disorder of aberrant salience. So he begins with this tradition of research into dopamine, citing the motivational salience hypothesis of dopamine functioning, whereby the mesolimbic dopamine system is seen as involved in the attribution of salience, a process whereby events and thoughts come to grab attention, drive action, and influence goal-directed behaviour because of their association with the reward or punishment. So in psychosis, the proposal is, using Kapoor's words, patients develop an exaggerated release of dopamine independent of and out of synchrony with the context. This leads to the assignment of inappropriate salience and motivational significance to external and internal stimuli. So in this view, Delusions arise when patients impose explanations on these experiences of aberrant salience in order to make sense of them, producing so-called insight relief, forming a guiding cognitive scheme for further thought and actions. Hallucinations, in this view, arise from the abnormal salience of the internal representations, the perceptions and memories. So... Kapoor combines this emphasis on hyperdopaminergia with uh, psychological notions. So with the administration of antipsychotic drugs which damp down dopamine activity, it attenuates the salience of ideas and, and percepts. And then the patient has the opportunity to work through the symptoms towards a psychological resolution. So this exemplifies a so-called two-factor account of delusions in which perceptions and ideas invested with abnormal salience linked to dysregulated dopamine physiology crystallise into delusions through additional reasoning processes. So several implications follow from these attempts to link biological and psychological accounts of how human beings develop intensely held yet unfounded beliefs that others intend harm, amongst other sorts of delusional, unfounded ideas. So one point is that both the biological and psychological continuum model posit a role for dysregulated mesolimbic dopamine transmission in delusion formation. So current psychological continuum models view this dopamine dysregulation and asso associated anomalous experiences as not necessary, but potentially part of a sufficient set of causes for delusions to emerge. Whereas in the more traditional biologically oriented research, the hyperdopaminergia is viewed as necessary for the emergence of delusions 
and whilst there can be many influences on dysregulation of the dopamine system, it's viewed as the funnel point through which different causal factors uh, produce abnormalities in brain function which mediate the transition to psychosis. But all of this raises um, the uh, question of what role the mesolimbic dopamine system plays in culturally normative belief acquisition and maintenance. If you reverse engineer Kapoor's proposal about the psychotic patient who develops an exaggerated release of dopamine independent of and out of synchrony with the context, the question here concerns what effects dopamine release has on beliefs and other aspects of cognition when it is dependent on and in synchrony with social context. So in an earlier paper called The Religious Brain, Turning Ideas into Convictions, I proposed that the orchestration of reinforcing cognitive symbolic and sensory affective stimuli and cultural displays, such as ceremonial ritual, as well as during more routine social interaction, invest culturally shared ideas, objects and actions with significance, memorability and motivational force, partly through activation of the mesolimbic dopamine system. So to extend this approach, understanding the social and cultural conditions under witchcraft accusi accusations flourish may provide insights into the reciprocal links between social context, cognition, and potentially brain function. So clearly a key issue here concerns how dysregulation should be distinguished from regulation of the dopamine system, an issue that we will come back to in light of discussion of witchcraft. So second point is that both biological and cognitive psychological continuum models emphasise the importance of reasoning biases in differentiating initial cognitive and experiential changes into formed delusions. Cultural constraints on cognition, including belief formation and reasoning, have been a particular focus of social anthropology <coughs> and its subsidiary branch of cognitive anthropology since the inception of anthropology as an academic discipline in the 19th century. This includes research on the types of reasoning involved in witchcraft. Historical <coughs> research on witchcraft has also tre treated the question of how people can come to believe in witchcraft as a historical problem to be addressed through a meticulous reconstruction of broader systems of ideas, social practices and contexts. So this raises the question of whether models of reasoning styles implicated in witchcraft beliefs can inform understanding of paranoia in the clinical sense. So to address these questions, we'll turn to witchcraft. So what is witchcraft? So witchcraft, it's an English word extended to describe apparently similar phenomena in different societies and periods of history. Central to any such usage is the notion that affliction or misfortune can be intentionally caused by the special actions of a person, the witch. As the social historian Keith Thomas wrote of witchcraft in England in the pre-modern period, the 16th and 17th centuries, to quote him, the belief in witchcraft can be defined as the attribution of misfortune to occult human agency. The witch was a person of either sex, more often female, who could mysteriously injure other people. The damage she might do, maleficium, as it was technically called, could take various forms. Usually she was suspected of causing physical injury to other persons or of bringing about their death. She might also kill or injure farm animals or interfere with nature by preventing cows from giving milk or by frustrating such domestic operations as making butter, cheese or beer. There was a wide range of other possible hostile actions but in England a witch's alleged activities usually came under one of these heads. The witch could exercise occult power in a variety of ways. So to quote Thomas again, sometimes her evil influence was conveyed through physical contact. The witch touched her victim or gave out a potent but invisible emanation from her eyes. In this case, the victim was said to have been fascinated or overlooked. Alternatively, the witch pronounced a curse or malediction which in due course took effect. Here the victim was said to have been forespoken. Rather less common was the witchcraft which involved technical aids, making a wax image of the victim and sticking pins in it, writing his name on a piece of paper and then burning it, burying a piece of his clothing, and so forth. 
In general, contemporaries seem to have been less interested in the mechanics of the operation than in the fact of the witch's malice. Yet the term witchcraft has been applied to, a, to such a wide range of beliefs and practices of different cultures and periods of history <coughs> that the possibility, even the very possibility of providing a fixed definition of the term has been questioned. But as with other universalised categories of the social sciences, such as religion, ritual, democracy or law, resemblances rather than strict equivalence between instances can be used to identify shared or typical features as well as a basis for understanding local particularity. In fact, one of the recurrent features of witchcraft may be its heterogeneity, that specific instances can hold together evolving and not always fully integrated notions of how harm can be influenced by another. So Thomas also writes of pre-modern English witchcraft. Many contemporary theologians would not have agreed that the essence of witchcraft lay in the damage it did to other persons, for then witchcraft was not malevolent magic as such, but a heretical belief, devil worship. The witch owed any power she might possess to the pact she had made with Satan, and her primary offence was not injuring other people, but heresy. The lawyer, Sir Edward Coke, accordingly defined a witch as a person that had conference with the devil to consult with him or to do some act. Around this notion was built up the extensive concept of ritual devil worship, involving the nocturnal Sabbath, at which the witches gathered to do homage to their master and to copulate with him. Other regions in pre-modern Europe had uh, also held partially overlapping but nevertheless distinct notions together in their concept of witchcraft. So to go back to Peter Gessier in his book Witchcraft, Intimacy and Trust, he argued that this variability and any dynamism of witchcraft notions and practices were integral to what they are. And in fact, given that he worked in the society from the 1970s to the present, he's actually able to describe the changes in these ideas and practices in the context of broader changes in society. He says that in many parts of the world, certainly in Africa, but also elsewhere, this Western term has been eagerly appropriated by the public. In the African context where I've worked, people use the term, or its <coughs> French equivalent, sorcellerie to an address an all-pervasive presence that covered all sorts of occult dangers and fears, surpassing local distinctions and demarcations. In this period, improved communication, migration and media access have led to much, much wider disseminations of notions of occult danger and power. This has transformed the earlier ethnographic situation of societies that were more geographically, socially and informationally contained. So, in his words... Witchcraft is not a traditional given, but a historical phenomenon. The particular and highly varying forms it takes in the African continent are shaped by deep historical changes in which colonisation and the ensuing global power relations are central. Despite the regional changes, he accepts that there are commonalities in witchcraft notions across societies. So he said, as he notes, on other continents as well, the basic image of witches as people who have acquired the ability to transform themselves, leave their bodies at night and fly off to nocturnal meetings in order to engage in horrible conspiracies is surprisingly general. He also observes that a recurrent feature of witchcraft imaginaries is that witches most often find their victims in their close surroundings. The exact form of proximity may vary. In some settings, for example, it may concern neighbours rather than relatives, or the sorcerer may be an outsider who works for an ally within. But there is almost always a link with intimacy, in some form. So the dynamics of witchcraft we can illustrate with an example from his work with the Maka. He recounts that when he started his field work, which he had originally intended to be about politics, to quote him, he says, my spokespersons invariably began to refer to the powers of the Jambe. Clearly to them, any form of power, whether of the village chief and the old notables in the village council, the authority of the family within their household was related to the jambe. They translated this term as sorcellerie in French, or even used the word sorcellerie when speaking Maka, the local language. So he says, people describe the jambe as a nasty creature living in someone's belly, which gives its owner special powers. The main power is the capacity to transform oneself into an animal or spirit. Especially at night when the owl calls, the jinjamb, 
the person who has cultivated this power will leave his or her body and fly off into the night along the cobwebs of the jambe to the shumbu, the nightly meeting of witches. Their terrible cannibalistic banquets are stage. Stories of the debaucheries of these nightly meetings, marked by shocking transgressions, violent encounters, and devious victories of many. But one element recurs in them all. Each jinjam has to offer a relative to be devoured by the other witches. In daily life, the victim of this nightly treason will fall ill and die, unless people call in the Nganga healer to see the guilty witches and force them to lift their spell. Basic to Maka discourse on the jambe is that it is about the betrayal of one's kin to outsiders. So we've already given the example at the beginning of Jean Eba. So in the same village some 20 years later, Eba's cousin Simon Mbang, another successful functionnaire, decided to return to the village when he reached retirement. After some years, he was accused by Hila of bringing a new form of urban witchcraft, Kong, to the village, a form especially associated with the conspicuous wealth and ostentation of the Nouveau Riche. Mbang lodged a complaint for defamation in a court of the local administrative centre after this accusation was made. The court quickly ruled in his favour, the speed of the judgment reflecting his contact, so it was heard within days as opposed to months or years, so it was considered to be remarkably fast by local standards. A heavy fine was imposed on his accuser, who disappeared the next day. However, members of Eba's side of the family believed the accusation, hinting that Mbang had used his special powers to advance his own children, but block others in the family. The two sides of the family cut ties, Geshier comments on how the two cases illustrate the tensions between urban elites and the villages, as well as between kin, reflecting growing social inequalities and spatial scales of life for the Maka, along with many other African communities. He observes how numerous innovations in witchcraft beliefs have arisen in tandem with these extraordinary new social and, uh, and economic inequalities and pressures. So these include new versions of belief in zombie witchcraft, where family members are no, no longer eaten, but put to work on invisible plantations to amass great wealth for witches. And feymen, confidence tricksters in the Cameroonian context, operating nationally and internationally, whose sometimes fantastic wealth and success are attributed to witchcraft. He says, even African migrants in Europe and America fear the telephone calls from home, with their endless demands undergirded with hidden threats. The association of family with rich witchcraft is a serious threat for migrants far away from home. It shows the impressive stretch and capacity of the family witchcraft complex. He identifies numerous factors involved in these innovations and indeed possibly even intensification of witchcraft beliefs. So for example, the established churches um, had tended to deny the reality of witches but newer forms of Pentecostal Christianity have strongly emphasised witchcraft and equated, equated it with the devil, along with the focus of miracles and prosperity through prayer and faith. And so the net effect of this, for example, may have been paradoxically to reinforce the local authority and salience of witchcraft ideas. Um, he also notes the effect of the relative absence of institutions buffering individuals and families from rapid and dramatic social and economic change. So to quote him, he says... Why do people refer to modernity in a way that makes it seem closely linked to witchcraft? In many parts of Africa, the forces of maternity, modernity, the world market, state formation, and the development of industry, but also education, modern healthcare, and new religious movements, affect the private sphere of the family and the home. Intermediate institutions that could mitigate the impact of such global forces seem to be relatively ephemeral and little developed in most African contexts. And so, in this respect, uh, it's notable that many of the historical studies uh, of uh, pre-modern Europe, witchcraft in pre-modern Europe, have shown the importance of local institutions in managing witchcraft accusations in communities which accepted this possibility. So, sometimes with the effect of actually intensifying the propensity to make accusations, but often with the effect of inhibiting them. So, in the English context, Thomas notes how the repeal in 1736 of the Witchcraft Act of 1604 followed growing scepticism about the possibility of witchcraft in the later 17th century amongst the educated classes and greater reluctance of judges and juries to convict 
in the countryside of Over, which beliefs persisted right through into the 19th century and actually probably further. I mean, so there have been ethnographies of witchcraft beliefs in rural, rural, rural France in the 1970s, for example. Um, but under these circumstances, villages turn to informal violence, counter magic, and the occasional lynching. So there was a case of Ruth Osborne in 1751, accused of witchcraft and lynched by a Hertfordshire mob after the mysterious illness of a farmer who refused her request for buttermilk. So the authorities now treated these acts of violence as murder. So he argues that lack of institutional support for witchcraft accusations and legal penalties for acting outside the law contributed to their broader decline. So if we now view witchcraft through the lens of paranoia, what can it teach us about witchcraft? We can consider this by considering further examples of what the historian uh, Alison Rowland termed the social and psychic tensions that lay behind the making of witchcraft accusations and confessions. So one example <coughs> can be taken from Thomas's analysis of patterns of English witchcraft, witchcraft accusation in the pre-modern period. So to, the most common situation for witchcraft accusation, to quote him, was when the victim or his parents had turned away empty-handed an old neighbour who had come to the door to beg or borrow some food or drink, or the loan of some household utensil. The overwhelming majority of English witch cases fell into this simple pattern. She was sent away, perhaps mumbling a malediction, and in due course something went wrong with the house or one of its members, for which she was immediately held responsible. A request made by the witch varied, but they were usually for food or drink, butter, cheese, yeast, milk or beer. Sometimes she asked for money or a piece of equipment. In all cases, denial was followed by retribution, and the punishment often fitted the crime. Thus at Castle Carey, which is in Somerset, around 1530, Isabel Turner denied Christian Sherston a quart of ale, whereupon a stand of ale of 12 gallons began to boil as fast as a crock on the fire. Joan Vickers would give her no milk, and thereafter her cow yielded nothing but blood and water. Henry Russ also refused to milk, only to find himself unable to make cheese until Michaelmas. I'll resist the temptation to say that in a Somerset accent. Summarising these and other examples, Thomas observes that the two essential features thus make up the background to most of the allegations of witchcraft levered in 16th and 17th century England. The first was the occurrence of a personal misfortune for which no natural explanation was forthcoming. The second was an awareness on the victim's part of having given offence to a neighbour, usually by having failed to discharge some customary social obligation. As often as not, the link between the misfortune incurred and the obligation <coughs> neglected was furnished by the frank expression of malignity on the part of the suspected witch, often in the form of curses, such as that God would shorten the lives of their enemies, burn their homes, kill their children, destroy their goods, and blast them and their descendants. So this was a society in which people believed that curses could kill. Everybody believed that, almost without exception. But he sets these recurrent conflicts in the context of broader social changes, which saw the breakdown of the tradition of mutual help upon which many English village communities were based. Increasing witchcraft accusations arose at a time when the old tradition of mutual charity was being sapped by the introduction of a national poor law. This made the model householder's role essentially ambiguous. The conflict between resentment and a sense of obligation produced the ambivalence which made it possible for men to turn women begging brusquely from the door and yet to suffer torments of conscience after having done so. The ensuing guilt was fertile ground for witchcraft accusations since subsequent misfortune could be seen as retaliation on the part of the, on the witch. Okay, so we have here then a picture of accusations typically made in the context of social conflict arising from disparity of resources and the attendant emotional conflict and ambivalence that arose in, the, in those from whom requests for assistance were made. The people doing the accusing were those in whom requests for assistance were made. Now consider now the case of the Nyong'o phenomenon. Now this is a particularly dreaded form of witchcraft among the Bakweri people of Western Cameroon 
studied by the Oxford social anthropologist Edwin Ardner. So Ardner's account of the relationship of Nyong'o to social and psychological <coughs> tensions is striking because he was able to track the emergence and fluctuation of this set of beliefs within the colonial and post-colonial situation of the Bakweri over many decades. So the belief itself involved the following key ideas. This is to quote Ardner. A person with Nyong'o was always prosperous, for he was a member of the witch association that had the power of causing its closest relatives, even its children, to appear to die. But in truth, they were taken away to work for their witch masters on another mountain 60 or 70 miles to the north, Mount Kupe, in the territory of the Bikosi people. On Mount Kupe, the Nyong'o people were believed to have a town and all modern conveniences, including motor lorries. Nyong'o people could best be recognised by their tin houses, which they had been able to build with the zombie labour force of their dead relatives. How this belief grew up, and by what processes, the association of dying children and the ownership of tin houses became so firmly fixed cannot easily be traced. But by 1953, the belief had taken such a hold that no one would build a modern house for fear of being accused of possessing Nyong'o. Indeed, Ardner comments that at this point in time, there is no doubt that all, quote, economic initiative was much affected by the climate of that belief. So Nyong'o emerged in the context of declining fortunes for the Bakweri. Before the German conquest of 1894, the Bakweri had enjoyed a period of relative prosperity following the introduction of 1845 of a new food crop, a type of cocoa yam, by a small missionary settlement. Prosperity and influence was further increased by trade with the coast and the acquisition of flintlock firearms. Following German conquest, Bakweri settlements were reorganised to allow large plantations, and migrant labour came to outnumber the locals. Prosteri prosperity declined, and reproductive rates fell with poverty and sexually transmitted diseases <coughs> from the involvement of Bakweri women in prostitution for migrant labour. Within this context, belief in Nyong'o appeared, most likely as an import in many of its details, so several lines of evidence suggest its origin outside Bakweri society. So the name is derived from a word in the neighbouring Douala language. The zombie town is located amongst another tribe in a mountain that Bakweri may not have known about before the colonial period. And the belief in zombies, though common in East and Central Africa, was not common in West Africa at the time. However, Arden points out that the use of a Bantu word, the Bakweri spoke a Bantu dialect, so the use of a Bantu word, somba, to describe pledging a relative from Nyong'o is the root of the word zombie in the Caribbean and so may indicate an earlier notion not explicitly recalled by the Bakweri, even at the point of transmission across the Atlantic was from another part of Africa. So Ardner summarises the social crisis within which belief in Nyong'o appeared as involving, in his words, a powerful ambivalence towards riches and property. The sudden breach of the isolation of the society accompanied, as is all too commonly the case with the victims of decline in power or status, by a sense of collective guilt, the low fertility and the fear of dying out. Perhaps all this turned against those who were thought to have benefited by the events which had caused so much damage, envy, disaster, property and witchcraft were once more in close association. In fact, Ardner observed an inverse correlation between economic prosperity and the Nyong'o phenomenon, noting also that ritual action to address Nyong'o altered economic behaviour. So in 1954, educated Bakweri and government officials introduced commercial banana farming. Critically, the villages themselves were organised as cooperatives rather than on an individual basis, so that all would gain. This occurred in the banana boom of the 50s, and the first full year of production, 1953, brought great prosperity. So Ardner describes how sums of the order of £100 per farmer entered Bakweri villages with their tumbling huts and empty tin houses. By common tacit consent, the making of small improvements, such as cementing a floor, began to be taken as not necessarily of Nyong'o origin. Then in 1955 and 1956, a masked figure called Abassi Nyong 
began to glide about the villages. Bakweri villages had used over £2,000 of the first banana revenue to purchase the secrets of a witch-finding association from the remote Banyang tribe. So this is an enormous sum of money. With the new advanced ritual technology, they began to clear the Nyongo witchcraft from the villages. And with the Nyongo threat removed, obviously, the next revenue could be spent on self-advancement. And yes, even on tin houses. However, by 1960, for a variety of reasons, the banana market weakened and the village cooperative started to lose money, accompanied by more adverse political conditions for the Bakweri. By 1963, the peasant economy was at a lower level than the boom time of the end of the 50s, but not at the level of the 60-year period from 1894 to 1954. In 1963, during this economic downturn, a rumour spread from Bakweri villages on the mountains that the elders had forbidden money to be picked up from the ground, since it was placed there to entice men to the waterside. Their Frenchmen would use them to work as zombies on a new deep sea harbour, or use them to appease the water spirits. So, in other words, economic downturn and increased social stress was accompanied by a reactivation of Nyongo-type beliefs, even though the Bakweri maintained that the old Nyongo spirits continued to be exorcised. So this is a diagram uh, that shows these different <coughs> historical periods. So this is pre-colonial, through a period of relative prosperity. The beliefs relating to witchcraft are less well specified then. Then there's a period of economic uh, prosperity. There is no Nyongo-type beliefs. This is when the Bakweri become marginal to plantations. Uh, they have a 60-year period of social decline and essentially a protracted social crisis, and the Nyongo system of beliefs emerges. And this is a period of prosperity where the Nyongo is controlled through ritual action and the beliefs decline. So with these different phases, so uh, this is the period of relative, this is the period of, of decline from the 60-year period in the first half of the 20th century. So there, there's no evidence of Nyongo-type belief. Nyongo emerges during prosperity, is dispelled, and then, uh, under economic stress, a related set of ideas uh, starts to emerge again. So, uh, so overall, these examples from the Maka, the Bakweri in pre-modern England, they all illustrate a very consistent conclusion from ethnographic and historical research that witchcraft, witchcraft preoccupations and accusations are more prominent under conditions of social and psychological stress. So to what extent do paranoid do causes of paranoid attributions also contribute to witchcraft accusa accusations? So as a basic observation, paranoid attributions, like witchcraft accusations, are more common under conditions of social and psychological stress. So Psychological processes that research has shown to mediate the relationship between paranoia and stress are also evident in witchcraft examples, uh, although variation in how the causal factor op operates reflects specific features of each case. So if we go back and consider these uh, causal factors. So worry, which maintains preoccupation with ideas of threat, might be more appropriate be termed fear or even dread in the case of witchcraft. Gradations of fear, anxiety and worry are present in the examples of Maka witchcraft. The threat of retaliation perceived by those who refused assistance to needy neighbours in pre-modern England and the backquery who dreaded becoming Nyongo slave labour. So the sense of fear is of course based on a prior belief in the possibility of witchcraft but when the belief is present and the circumstances are fitting fear intensifies preoccupation and perceived threat. Versions of negative self-belief, which in the case of paranoia contribute to a sense of inferiority and vulnerability, appear to be present in some cases of those making witchcraft allega allegations. So perhaps the clearest example is, um, is the uh, examples given by Keith Thomas of the sense of guilt in those who refused assistance to poor neighbours in pre-modern England, which underpin their sense of vulnerability to retaliation by witchcraft. But more generally, case of witchcraft attributions occurring in the context of low mood or other forms of psychological distress 
raised the question of individual vulnerability to what in secular psychiatric terms would be considered depression or other common mental illnesses. So negative self-belief is a risk factor for depression as well as paranoia, and depression arising in the context of feelings of inferiority they m so may therefore be accompanied by a sense that others intend harm, or a belief that the psychological distress is itself caused by somebody else, for example through witchcraft in societies which endorse this possibility. Nevertheless, th these relationships are complex, um, because the link between how you, what you believe about yourself and your perceived inferiority and vulnerability to harm vary with local patterns of social relations. So the Bakweri who believe themselves to be at risk of Nyong'o by unaccountably prosperous relatives may have had a sense of economic or social inferiority. So that links inferiority to a sense of envy which motivates the accusation. But unlike the case of England, where it was poor, most, most commonly poor elderly female neighbours who were asking for assistance, who were accused of witchcraft, in the Bakweri example, it's prosperous individuals who are accused of witchcraft. So actually the social relations, the complex ideas do vary from case to case. So this ties in with some recent research into, into paranoia, actually, which whereby the sense of vulnerability, being vulnerable to attack by others seems to be most associated with relative accentuations of social dominance. So it is people who are more, um, who are more dominant and more subdominant who often fear themselves to be most at risk from attack or harm from others. Now, secular, so anomalous experiences, now that's a secular term. Now, these are obviously common in the case of witchcraft, uh, in the, where people make witchcraft attributions. Now, whether we're talking about hallucinations or dissociative alterations in the control, ownership, and awareness of thoughts, feelings, and movements. And so there are many, many examples of this from ethnographic and uh, historical literature. I mean, one well-known example is the claimed bewitchment and demonic possession of Mary Glover in 1602, about three or four miles away from here. Um, where she accused a neighbour of causing her to be uh, bewitched and she, um, she manifested a, a, a sort of rather typical form of demonic uh, possession which attracted a great deal of um, political attention. Uh, now the point here is that apparently spontaneous or pre-reflective alterations in experience can conform to locally acquired beliefs and expectancies providing a mechanism by which experiential changes can provide apparent proof of witchcraft, as with paranoid ideas more generally. So we've done a lot of research using suggestion in highly hypnotizable people, for example, to show how you can alter experience uh, in ways that people experience as involuntary or automatic. So from a, let's think about this from a, a biological perspective. And we're on the home stretch now, perhaps another... We start a little late, so let's spend another 10 minutes on this and we'll have a time for a discussion if we can um, focus ourselves. So from a biological perspective, the mesolimbic dopamine system has been implicated in the formation of delusions with a key proposal that its dysregulation invests ideas and perceptions with aberrant salience. The precipitation of psychotic symptoms, including delusions, under circumstances of social, psych social and psychological stress, <coughs> implies that these conditions potentiate, stress potentiates, dysregulation of the mesolimbic dopamine system in predisposed individuals. But it, of course, as we've discussed before, this raises the question of what role the mesolimbic dopamine system plays in culturally normative belief acquisition and maintenance, including under condition of conditions of stress. So the mesolimbic dopamine system is one of several neuromodulatory systems. In other words, systems which modulate the activity of large populations of neurons to influence cognition and behaviour. So another term for a neuromodulatory system is an arousal system. So following on from our early, earlier discussion and consideration of evidence from witch, witchcraft, there are several ways in which emotional arousal may contribute to the cognitive and emotional salience of ideas that others intend harm, whether as witchcraft beliefs or other types of culturally normative attributions. 
So let's consider these. So we, we can actually frame these as a series of hypotheses. So one idea is that ideas of social agency, and in particular of threat, are intrinsically arousing, partly mediated through activity of the mesolimbic dopamine system. And this contributes to the salience and memorability and social transmission of these ideas. That's one hypothesis. A second hypothesis is that embedding representations that others intend harm in communicative contexts that emotionally inflect them. So this can range from nonverbal communication in everyday interaction to highly salient um, cultural uh, displays and performances enhances the cognitive salience, the perceived reality, and the inferential force or relevance of representations that others intend harm. So again, the hypothesis that these effects are partly mediated through increased activity of the mesolimbic dopamine system. So this is the kind of emotional embedding in cultural displays and communication of ideas that others intend harm. Now the third possibility, or the third hypothesis, is that the potentiation of mesolimbic dopamine activity under conditions of social conflict and stress lowers the threshold for attributions that others intend harm. So this may manifest as the reactivation of ideas under stress that would otherwise be quiescent, such as Nyong'o or related ideas in the case of the back query, which parallel the rekindling of paranoid delusions under conditions of stress in patient populations. So you see amongst the back query, there is a type of relapsing, rebitting pattern, a correlation between stress and intensification of these types of belief. And similarly, we know that from patients with a vulnerability to psychosis, that stress can exacerbate or intensify uh, paranoid ideas, actually even getting the difference between getting somebody to walk down to Camberwell and back um, intensifies paranoid ideation in predisposed individuals more than just staying in a room at the Institute of Psychiatry. So we know that there is this relationship. So a general human propensity of this kind acquires local specificity through ideas such as those relating to witchcraft that have been culturally learned. So in other words, uh, uh, the, the role of stress in potentiating mesolimbic <coughs> activity is locally articulated through locally available ideas. So to summarise this, you could say the mesolimbic dopamine system is involved in biasing cognition towards a type of representation <coughs> that others intend harm. And the threshold for using this type of representation to interpret the social world. So to confirm these hypotheses would require us to have a better understanding of the role of the mesolimbic system in normal cognition, and in particular, its <coughs> modulation within social interaction and experience, but also in relation to the ideas shared within a culture. So it's the idea, it's the notion that all, not all ideas are equivalent with respect to their effect on the mesolimbic dopamine system, that the mesolimbic dopamine system is differentially modulated by ideas expressed within a culture which affects their, their salience and transmission. Okay, so that's looking at witchcraft through the lens of paranoia, but now let's look at paranoia through the lens of witchcraft. So clearly accounts of witchcraft that we've been considering all emphasise social and cultural influences on the beliefs and behaviour of individuals. So the question here is to what extent can psychological processes and brain processes involved in delusion formation, to what extent are they linked to social and cultural processes? So let's um, consider this question through some further work by Edwin Ardner in his paper Some Outstanding Problems in the Analysis of Events. So that was a paper from 1978, uh, which drew on his previous research on the Nyong'o phenomenon amongst the back query. So he says, in his words, he said, certain kinds of zombie manifestations were correlated with low economic performance of the mass of the population. Yet that which correlated on each occasion was not the symbolic content of the behaviour. This was separately assembled at the different periods of manifestation, or so I hypothesised, through new symbols or through newly arranged old symbols. Thus, at one period, zombie manifestations were caused by persons who had built corrugated iron or tin houses. 
they were thought to kill their younger relatives and to use them as zombie labour. At another period, the zombie phenomena were thought to be caused by Frenchmen. The content was not continuous over time, but something else was, a repetitive, distinctive structuring tendency that I then called a template. In fact, Arden has speculated that there may even have been an earlier now forgotten manifest, manifestation of the zombie witchcraft template in the 19th century or before, given the use of the word somber, most likely con- con- cognate with zombie, to designate pledging a relative to Nyong'o. So in his earlier work, Arden had distinguished between template structures, what he called template structures, and structures of realisation. So the template is the underlying structure of ideas, and then the structure of realisation is a particular version in time. He later used the distinction between paradigm and syntan in linguistics to describe them as P structures and S structures respectively. So this, so this is the era of, of structuralism and post-structuralism, and like theorists of that time, he was using Saussurean linguistics to provide a, an idiom to characterise these processes. So the S structures are the particular versions of zombie witchcraft realised in the stream of events. The P structures, by contrast, are inferred from the contingent manifestations of S structures. So we have to kind of work back from the S structures to infer what is the nature of the underlying principle or tendency linking the ideas. In, in his terms, the S structures were generated from the P structures by what he termed a mode of specification. So these are implicit rules which allow contingent conditions to express the underlying system of ideas of the peace structure. So he says, when we talk of witchcraft as having elements of universality, it is easy to see that we're talking of certain similarities essentially between peace structures, despite the peculiarities of the observable aspects of backquery zombie manifestations compared with English witchcraft. The difference between the peace structures is much less great. We can hypothesise a peace structure thus. Misfortune has a personal cause. We require a mode of specification of the kind of events that qualifies misfortune and where to find the personal causes. Very similar peace structures may have very different modes of specification that's generating very different S structures. So he emphasises the unconscious automatic character of peace structures. In his words... The peace structures of a certain unconscious, blind, or automatic quality, they are not all open to awareness. So his account has an important implication for how to conceptualise the effect of culture on explanations of misfortune. When we look at this phenomenon that we have chosen to call witchcraft, we can see at once that changes may occur in the peace structures, in the mode of specification, and in the S structures. If the peace structure changes to misfortune as an impersonal cause, witchcraft vanishes. So he was writing in the era of post-structuralism, but he can be viewed as independently arriving at a concept of what in cognitive anthropology is now called a cultural model or schema. At a brain level, the peace structure or schema that misfortune has a personal cause enlists so-called mentalising networks. So these are brain systems that represent social agency and attention, intention to represent maleficent agency in the form of a witch. The contingent details are supplied by local combinations of new information which are inferentially relevant in terms of the schema. So, for example, Geshier notes how in Kong, a form of zombie witchcraft similar to Nyong'o, Mount Coupe is now imagined as a staging post where zombie relatives are sold to the mafia as part of global circuits of labour exploitation. So in his terms, the S structure has changed again, incorporating contingent, historically contingent details. So note here that the brain systems used to support representations of agency and social intention are enlisted as part of a culturally acquired causal attributional style triggered under relevant circumstances. Yet the peace structure or schema linking misfortune to maleficent agency can change. So if it changes, if the peace structure changes, if the structure of ideas changes, then the brain systems used to represent that also change their activity. 
Uh, so, for example, if if misfortune is now conceptualised as having an impersonal cause, you no longer recruit mentalising that work to form representations of that. It's a different attributional style. So the question here is, the schemata are learned or internalised from interactions with the social and physical world during development. The acquisition of schemata is influenced by arousal systems, such as the mesolimbic dopamine system, through a range of potential mechanisms of the kind that we've discussed above. So, critically, the emotional inflection of ideas and social interaction. So brain activity is modulated by cultural learning and social context during development and immediate responses to the world. So, research on paranoia identified reasoning biases as contributing to the emergence and maintenance of paranoid, paranoid ideation. So the processes of cultural learning we consider here suggest that any variations of individual reasoning within a particular population occur within the context of interpretive schema and styles of reasoning that are shared or learned within a social group. So if you apply this perspective to paranoia, it suggests that different types of paranoid attribution can be analysed as contingent manifestations of underlying schemata. S structures and P structures, respectively, in Ardner's terminology. So this draws attention to the cultural sources of ideas incorporated into paranoid attributions, and in particular the social context and media through which they're transmitted. So while some notions are widely communicated in a society, others are elaborated and conveyed within informational enclaves, such as small groups, or indeed the virtual communities of the internet. So while paranoia has traditionally been explained by causal processes <clears throat> which are intrinsic to the individual, elucidating the cultural origin and transmission of paranoid ideation re-embeds individual psychology and brain function within the social world. The relationship of individual psychology to society and culture has a bearing on when paranoia and witchcraft attributions should be considered pathological. So Let's conclude then just by considering the relationship between pathology and normativity. The contrast between a traditional biological model, which has tended to view paranoia as a result of cognitive and brain processes that have gone deeply awry due to disease, and recent psychological approaches, which emphasise a continuum of paranoid ideas in the population, can be understood in terms of what should be taken to imply a dysregulation as opposed to regulation of brain systems such as the mesolimbic dopamine system and accompanying psychological processes. So paranoid ideas which are highly discrepant from shared notions of a relevant social group or which are associated with other types of positive psychotic symptom such as thought disorder or hallucinations suggest that constraints on cognition and brain function have become uncoupled from those operating across a social group as a whole. So highly discrepant ideas associated with other symptoms of psychosis suggest more idiosyncratic cognitive and brain processes uncoupled from the group as a whole. So under these conditions, culturally mediated ideas can nevertheless become incorporated into the paranoid ideas of individuals, though often in highly idiosyncratic ways. Indeed, during the emergence of psychosis, there is an attraction to cultural schemata which convey paranoid ideas, including notions of witchcraft, to an extent that would not otherwise be the case. Alternatively, the emergence of paranoid ideas which are shared with those of a relevant social group also suggests shared constraints on cognition and brain function. The ideas may be unfounded, preoccupying, distressing and even motivate violence, but they're not pathological in the psychiatric sense. Between these poles is clearly scope for individual and subcultural variation. So, for example, the ability of individuals with a propensity to psychotic or quasi-psychotic ideas and experiences, schizotypy, to seek out virtual communities of like-minded people, complicates clinical judgments about pathology and normality. Equally, it's possible for a person to interpret symptoms of common mental disorders, such as low mood, excessive fatigue or anxiety, as well as psychotic symptoms, as a result of witchcraft. 
So witchcraft attributions may powerfully influence the characteristics, the course and response to treatment of the illness. So in these circumstances, the illness may simultaneously satisfy diagnostic criteria for mental disorder and local criteria for bewitchment. So to conclude, witchcraft is a historical and cultural phenomenon and paranoia is a clinical phenomenon. Both involve attributions that others intend to harm. Paranoid ideation and witchcraft attributions are more common under conditions of social and psychological stress. Research has identified specific psychological causal factors and dysregulated mesolimbic dopamine system is implicated in the emergence and maintenance of paranoid ideation. These psychological and brain processes may also be implicated in the interpretation of misfortune as due to witchcraft, particularly in the context of social conflict and psychological stress. But this would require further research to substantiate those um, hypotheses. And, it, and I think particularly in understanding the role, the cognitive effects of arousal systems in intensifying the salience of witchcraft attributions in the context of learnt responses to stress. But equally, anthropological and historical accounts of witchcraft show how cultural learning and social context inform interpretation of the world, including under conditions of conflict and stress. So re-embedding the psychology and neurobiology of paranoia in social and cultural processes is relevant to considering what should count as pathology in the context of social variation, of human variation. Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks, Quinton. Um, gosh, that was a feast of uh, um, psychiatry, neuroscience, and social anthropology. Um, can I start by just wa asking why you chose witchcraft as your um, as your case study, um, rather than uh, other forms of, you know, cultural belief? I mean, religious belief being the obvious example. Why, why, why have you selected witchcraft? Well, witchcraft is um, relevant for a number of... It's, a, it's actually a very good question, because, of course, witchcraft is not universal. Um, witchcraft beliefs are not universal. So the, I think the relevance of the question relating to witchcraft is because they provide... A, um, a good example of a culturally or socially shared system of ideas which in certain respects resemble or overlap with paranoid attributions uh, but which unlike at least our formal definition of paranoia differ in the important respect that they're socially shared uh, and, and in some sense culturally normative although clearly there can be difficult questions about exact judgments under which actually and it, as certain individuals witchcraft attributions are so discrepant from the way those attributions are made within a particular social context that they should in actual fact be classified as psychopathology so I think it gets us straight into the question of um, how it is that human beings come how interpretation of the world, the social world and the physical world, is shaped by social conflict and stress, and how attributions of how harm, how others can present harm, um, are constrained and motivated by a variety of processes, inter interrelated processes, which are simultaneously cultural, social, cognitive and biological. So it's a kind of it's a sort of um, parallel earth for uh, paranoia um, and therefore invites us to consider the range of influences on paranoia. But it's not the only example that could be taken. But it is actually, interestingly, I think the notion of threat, the hostility and threat, maleficium, is so central to the notion that it is particularly well matched to understanding paranoia. Because if you are understanding other types of 
um, representation in religious contexts, for example, many of those, they, they may include at points notions of threat, but often threat is not intrinsic to uh, other religious concepts, other imaginate conceptions of religious agents or other religious imaginaries. Nick. Thanks, Quentin. Um, you commented on early on on the fact that in modern psychiatric nosology, for a belief to be classified as a delusion, it's, it's supposed to be sort of have its n equals one, or at least n equals not very many quality. You know, it should yeah. be a culturally shared belief. Whereas, obviously, in the witchcraft examples you were giving, the the, the converse is true. These are culturally shared yes. and, and um, sanctioned beliefs. Um, now, I don't think that's a problem for the argument you want to make in, in terms of all those kind of reasoning biases and all those other factors that you mentioned can, could be you know, relevant in, in either case. But still, there is a, you know, there's a striking difference uh, between those, uh, the, those two scenarios. And I just wondered if you wanted to, to say anything about that because you know, in, in, you know, they, they seem sort of rather, rather opposed in, in that way. And I just wonder, what, is that important for the argument you want to make? Or? Yeah, it is important. Uh, it's, it's fundamental, actually. Um, because if, if we operate with the traditional definition, then we, um, and particularly if we do so within a, the, the, you know, the traditional approach of biological or psychiatric research, up until quite recently, of course, psychologists have been adopting a somewhat different approach with the continuum models, which probably started in the late 1960s, but they've sort of gathered pace over the past sort of 10 or 15 years or so. Um, the uh, question of how... Uh, it raises the question of regulation and dysregulation, and it raises, raises the question of pathology and normativity. So, obviously, you have to be able to sort out um, the direction of inference when you're moving from one level to another to avoid a kind of circular reasoning. But if we operate with phenomenological criteria which um, emphasise the content of belief and experience and then try to also include a criterion about normativity or not, being socially shared or not, then that becomes a criterion by which we can judge causal processes. So we make an inference from normality or abnormality to making inferences about how we classify underlying causal processes. Um, so therefore, if we want to uh, understand processes uh, contributing to socially shared ideas, then we have to understand... Well, let me turn that around, actually. So we've spent... 2018, we spent maybe 100 years uh, viewing uh, paranoia as a disease or as part of a disease and therefore the bulk of the research has assumed normality without really specifying it and much of the focus in case control studies have been on what goes wrong in individuals but the corresponding question of what those systems do in ordinary development and ordinary functioning has been much less addressed and so we have a much thinner conception of how it is that the arousal systems and cognitive processes and so on are enlisted and recruited in normal development, including normal development, which includes accusing your prosperous uncle of Nyonga. Um, or, indeed, so the other way of, of running this argument is, so there's a historian called Norman Cohn, um, a social historian, um, who wrote three books, um, or is known for three books. So the first one is The Pursuit of the Millennium. It, he was Jewish, and he was very interested in anti-Semitism. So he wrote, he traced the history of anti-Semitism through European history by starting with notions of millenarianism in the, um, in the sort of late, late, really from late antiquity up until the early Middle Ages, and how particularly the Crusades and millenarian were often accompanied by pogroms. And then he wrote a book, Europe's Inner Demons, which was about tracing ideas about witchcraft accusations and how periods of in, uh, how they were also linked to a series of ideas which also became linked to characterisation of 
the Jews as sort of nefarious out group, um, and then trace that idea into the protocols of the, uh, the the international protocols of the elders of Zion, which is a sort of racist anti-Semitic tract of the 19th century, which formed part of a set of ideas that justified Nazis. Um, but actually, if you if you think of that Yuzardin as idea of a P structure and S structure, you actually see a history of contingent manifestations which vary through different periods of generations, across generations, different periods of history. But actually there are some very striking like, themes that persist through that um, about the um, stereotypic prejudice, preju prejudice and towards the social and cognitive dynamics about blaming our groups for perceived misfortune. Um, so we didn't have to take the example of witchcraft, but what we do have to take is, I think, what is, we do need to understand to understand our nature as human beings is to understand our propensity to um, uh, to make to make personal causal attribution and apply them to individuals as groups to account for what we perceive to be misfortune, which is implicated in so many of the problematic political and interpersonal dynamics that we have. So I think paranoia can teach us about um, normal cognition, and normal cognition can teach us about paranoia, but normal cognition is always socially embedded. So it's understanding how the processes are linked up. But there is a crucial difference, isn't there, in the sense that you know, if an idea kind of spreads like a miasma through, um, you know, through a population or, or, or through a group, uh, you know, that's got something to do with suggestibility. Whereas, you know, one of the quality when you when you talk to somebody that's, that's delusional, well, one of the th very striking things about that is that they are not very suggestible to your attempts to, or anyone else's attempts to present a different, you know, interpretation for their their, their data. Let's let's call it. Um, they're very lock, locked and fixed, as it says in the, D in the DSM. Mm. Whereas. Uh, uh, an idea that spreads, that, that's socially shared and, and spreads quickly, uh, seems to me almost the converse of that. So I, th I think that you know some of the psychological processes, and therefore the biological processes of alignment, must be quite distinct, even though there may be some. Well, that's th that. Therefore, is exactly the point. Really, it raises the question of dysregulation, or if you like, um, what happens when the processes go awry. So what are the normal processes that go awry in the emergence of the most severe manifestations of mental illness? Sort of bearing in mind, actually, the uh, yes, it's quite true that one does encounter clinically people with very dense delusional systems in a very classical mm. way, and that's not uncommon, actually. Uh, but then you also see... If, you know, often when people are treated with antipsychotics, you see the recovery from that process, and then you see the reactivation of that process when they become non-compliant with antipsychotics or smoke cannabis or um, get you know get their housing benefits stopped. Mm. Um, so you see a fluctuation. Um, so the so it, in a way. The, the most extreme manifestations, the most socially disconnected and extreme disordered manifestations of those processes underline the question, actually, is what's, what's normal function? Um, and I think the... Um, because it, it, the assumption here is that there is a set of normal constraints on cognition and brain function which become disordered under certain situations. And, but it cannot be that, um, or it, it seems to me very unlikely, and actually there's already, I think, good evidence just in this case, but it would be very unlikely that in psychiatry we're dealing with a class of uh, causal uh, processes which are qualitatively so profoundly distinct that they're incurring in the disease situation that they have no implications at all for understanding normal cognition. Oh no, I mean, I completely, completely accept that, yeah. Just, yeah, I mean, it's sort of a related theme. I mean, I'm thinking, I've been thinking a lot about sort of, uh, Thomas Metzinger's um, thinking in relation to something you're talking about. So, um, 
and particularly around you, you mentioned mentalization circuits and the sort of construction of self other relations and, and so on. Um, and one more relating to Nick's point, really, there's something about um, at the individual level of, of, of individual psychopathology, the, the classic paranoid you talk about. There's clearly something about the way in which that belief system operates, which is a drive towards increasing isolation and relative dysfunctionality in relation to conspecifics and all of that, whereas in the sort of group process that we're talking about, there seems to be some kind of potential functionalism, and what Metzing refers to as kind of the teleo-functionalism of ideas that mental states are, are important, not so much for their content, but for the consequence that they have and the way that they operate, particularly in the social media. And that's, again, maybe a similar point where I'm struggling slightly about. I mean, I, I accept the point that the, the social and the, and the individual c can illuminate, but I'm, I'm struggling slightly with how we might, one might think about that relationship where, at the group level, a group under stress mm -hmm. might reach for a narrative framework which, um, much as you've described, sort of vilifies and, and other and another outgroup of some sort, and there's then an explanatory framework which allows the group, in many respects, to kind of cohere, protect itself, and you know, mm -hmm. demonise others. But that analogy doesn't seem to quite sort of yeah. apply at the individual level. That that form of argument, which you're using, uh, sort of dominated social anthropology for British social anthropology in particular um, for 50 years or so, in the form of uh, um, structural functionalism. Mm. Uh, so it's the, the idea that traditional society is essentially a homeostatic mechanisms for preserving role structures and internal coherence. Or meeting threat. Or, or, or meeting threat, right. Things. And uh, so, so ritual had an inherently conservative, socially conservative function in mitigating or expressing or handling certain sorts of threat. Although those ideas are not widely adopted in anthropology these days. Um, and in actual fact, the tone of much of the, you know, certainly reading Gashieri's book, um, who's a social anthropologist, um, it, 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 witchcraft is, is very difficult for him not to write about it. It's something which is actually profoundly problematic within the societies that he's writing about, which is occurring in the context of uh, sort of gigantic um, economic and social changes, uh, but which often... Uh, is uh, associated with very high levels of violence and social stress and breakdown. Um, so I, I think the question of the, the question of what the, the function of witchcraft ideas is, I don't think it's possible to I don't think that can be handled because I think the, the consequences of it are just so diverse. Um, it's, yeah, I, I, I think providing a kind of unitary social information, a, a social explanation and trying to taxonomise that is extremely difficult. Well, I, I would agree with you, but I think maybe the analogy I'm with you, we're talking about sort of brain dysregulation as yeah. in some way causally relating to a psychological dysregulation. Yeah. Presumably there's some kind of, there would, would you think there'd be some kind of analogy with the, at the social level, so we'd have to then start thinking about some idea of social regulation social regulation what social regulation so, of cognition yeah so in, you were making the analogy with the was it the inner model you were talking about and mm. stuff after that was that the, there were various um there's a, there's a network of of um individually non you know, we talked about various factors that that, 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 that clump together to create a, a paranoid belief system so mm. just if one maps that to the social level presumably there's a constellation of socioeconomic factors stress mm. levels, whatever it is um, that are operating together to create some notion of a kind of social paranoia which we're reading as witchcraft or mm. whatever it might be. So is that the kind of analogy that you're trying to avoid? Or to, that, that's where I was struggling slightly. Well, I think, so I think under conditions of... Uh, so th th there will be a great deal of paranoia at the no. Institute of Psychiatry at different points when people feel under stress. So, so it's actually trying to understand how... What are the what are the cognitive? So we interpret the world in the context of our prior development, mm -hmm. and the effect and our ideas about the world, our interpretations of the world, 
influence our emotional reactions to the world, and what the world is doing to us influence our emotional reactions. And so hyper-arousal that attends various types of social challenge, which may stem from how we interpret things or how the world impinges on us, uh, alters the type of attributions that we make. And the type of attributions that we make are articulated through available idioms which are socially <coughs> plausible and learned. Um, so the point about the ethnography is actually what those conceptual resources are vary quite a lot, socially and historically, certainly in the contingent details. But you can perhaps make limited generalisations about sort of families or types of representation which have family resemblances. In witchcraft happens to be a, you know, a very successful compelling set of ideas, cross culturally and civilizationally, and which is particularly manifest under conditions of social threat. But racism is an extremely, uh, you know, extremely uh, persuasive set of ideas to most people, and spreads particularly rapidly, and becomes prominent under conditions of social stress. And all, all, so different ways of articulate. So I think probably we had to make a specious typical generalization perhaps one of the things that is important for us to stand, understand is why, under conditions of stress, people have a low threshold for making attributions that other people are trying to harm them or are the cause of their difficulties. And that can manifest itself in, in kind of the interpretation of your own micro-world, but also into politics as well, in different ways. So I think if, so if you, it depends at what sort of level you're thinking about these phenomena, but if, if it is true that arousal systems bias cognition when we're under stress towards it lowers the threshold, a type of attribution and the threshold for making an attribution, then it, there is also then an understanding of how we understand how that links up to social learning. So it's, I was just reading recently one of the most recent iterations of this dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, and it's really actually very striking. So in the paper by uh, Oliver Howes, and um, Shittish Kapoor, 2011. It's really striking the language that they've adopted, how far they've moved in the direction, essentially, of a social explanation of psychosis. Mm. Um, but so, with the idea of, of this, you know, pre striatal hyperdopaminergia being a funnel point, as they say, for a whole range of constraints that can perturb that process, but where the effect of that on, condi uh, on cognition is mediated through individual and culturally, socially or culturally and schemata. So it's actually the, so the kind of the language is actually starting to be even adopted within the kind of within the context of you know, what you might expect to be the most biological approaches. Um, so I think um, in is a that, way... Is that, Quentin, is that not a problem for the approaches though? Because if, if the approaches are basically amounting to uh, Explanations for witchcraft. I mean, you give the example of Ardner making this analysis of fluctuations of witchcraft beliefs according to, you know, in line with social social changes, adverse social changes. Um, if you know Freeman, Garrity, Oliver Howells, Sitish Kapoor are effectively giving explanations of witchcraft, doesn't that limit their um, their clinical significance? Because witchcraft and, as you were saying, witchcraft and paranoid beliefs occurring in clinical co contexts have yeah. particular differences. That's, why, well, that's I why you're taking the case study. Well, I think <coughs> so. I think so. I think two points. So it, one, it gets back to how you handle the notion of the continuum. I mean, there are different ways of approaching that. Your question. So one actually is that uh, the, you know the, the the kind of psychological continuum approaches and where the biological research is. They they're, they're kind of somewhat you can see that they're somewhat converging even though they differ in emphasis and the level of detail that they specify. Um, there are a number of points there. So one of them actually is um, the, the whole question of actually what is, what are the socio-cultural schemata and how do they operate through which we interpret the world remains a black box. Um, and I think it's going to remain a black box until we can link in more qualitatively oriented uh, understandings of how people acquire their understanding of, of the world, how people become acculturated and socialised. So, you, so I think that's what anthropology and history bring to the table. Actually, it's a kind of fuller specification of that level 
of which human lives are organised. Uh, and I think the quantitative bias and the methodological individualism of both psychiatry and psychological research is an embarrassment and a limitation when it comes to an understanding these dimensions of human experience. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, other problem uh, is goes back to the question of pathology and normativity. And I would go back to the point that uh, you can't understand how a system really goes awry until you understand the system when it's awry. You know, you need to understand the normal processes to understand deviation. Um, so the explanation as to why it is that um, a, a, a person is simultaneously attracted to notions which articulate um, a sense of persecution in the culture and yet draws highly idiosyncratic inferences from that. Um, to understand that type of process, I do think you need to understand what, for example, the normal biology of socially embedded arousal system function is. Um, it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's a consequence of psychiatric research that we're always, because we've been dominated by case control methodologies for so long, uh, that normality is always underspecified. And actually, normality is always underspecified because we always do our studies in Western societies, almost always. And so we just don't understand the other, and we always do our societies in print. We don't have a TARDIS. So we don't know what was happening in Clermont for a thousand years ago when the Pope launched the First Crusade. Um, so that, that's the difficulty we have. We, there are inherent biases in the way we construe the world. Do you think we will ever solve this problem? Uh, I'm a bit pessimistic, but in essence, even if we find how the, the way people embed what they see as society and learning, uh, then at some point we need to decide what is a normal society. But would it be ever possible to do that? Because to have a normal society? Yeah. What's, yeah. So we can well, I s yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I suppose it begs the question of what might count. I mean, I think, I think that this is one of the tricky things about this, actually, is that, that, that I, don't think, I don't think there is a normal society. Exactly, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I think, that, I think there is variation, which has causes. Um, there, are probably, there are probably social conditions which are more conducive to human flourishing, to use the Aristotelian term, than others. But I don't think we can fix a normal society. I think it's just too, it's too profoundly conditioned by our judgments about what counts as normality, which is too plastic. So then, even if we uh, learn everything there is to learn about embedding, uh, you know, the, the things that we experience uh, when growing up and uh, uh, how we understand society and culture, if we cannot agree that this a normal something that's normal, we can never get a normal range for the bending of these experiences. Oh, I see. Yes. So, I, I, so I think well, all you know, all reasoning of this sort is analogical. So, every case that we consider becomes a partial analogy for every other case that we consider. So, it's always it's it's always a form of analogical reasoning. But in order to strengthen the analogies, we need to extend the range of cases that we consider. But it, it's not they will always be less than the total number of cases that we could consider. John? Yeah, if you do a phenomenological analysis of the persecutory <coughs> delusions held by schizophrenic people diagnosed as schizophrenic by other things, compared with the persecutory delusions held by psychotic depressives, mm. um, the main thing that comes out is that the psychotic depressants um, believe that they are being harmed by a person, whereas the schizophrenic believe that they are being harmed by some non-person, either thing or wave. Or and it's quite, it's quite, um, it's quite, it's quite clear cut. And I think when you're talking about psychosis, a lot of the things you say would seem to me to fit better with a depressive psychosis or the the affective. Um, um, psychosis in general, and what you said is very interesting about the um, the stress and the because it reminds one of, of life events are, are almost invariably um, needed for a depressive illness to start. With. I don't think they are with schizophrenia. Um, 
There's a few suggestions. I wonder if you want to pick up any of them. Yeah, so the point, yeah, the point about structure of paranoid ideation is an interesting one. Um, I think, in actual fact, it, it, the, a, an analysis of paranoid ideation would show that it's very uncommon for there to be a truly impersonal external attribution in a, in a, a paranoid system. So it might be that you're being irradiated, but there is somebody irradiating you. There's always an agent lurking behind. Um, it, I think true. Yeah, I think I, I, I think that's a matter of debate. Actually, I think that's probably a factual question, which is a matter of debate. But I wouldn't accept that. Um, the uh, and then the second question, actually, about the relationship between stress. And psychosis. Well, I think actually epidemiologically there is there is good evidence that one of the precipitants for or intensifiers or precipitants for psychotic symptoms are psychosocial stresses of various kinds, as indeed the precipitants for depressive episodes include psychosocial stress of various kinds. So I think there is a question of actually understanding what it is that renders one person reacting with a schizophrenic type psychosis, another reacting with a depressive episode. Of course, some people are so, their, if you like, their diathesis to schizophrenia is so profound that the condition manifests itself in the absence of apparent external stresses. But then it, and, and so that would fall within the range of explanation of understanding uh, risk for a condition, which is... Uh, where the, if you like, the intrinsic risk factors are so loaded that the external precipitant uh, isn't apparent or is negligible. Uh, so I think that that's that's reasonable, uh, but it also begs the question of actually what the prior experiences were in development that may have uh, reinforced the vulnerability to psychosis. But I accept actually there'll be certain conditions where there is a, a just a very very high loading of developmental risk factors which make the outcome of psychosis inevitable. Yeah. Yeah, um, in the Western tradition, um, practitioners of witchcraft tended to be women. Um, I was wondering whether you had a psychosocial explanation for this uh, and whether you also had an explanation for why it seems like women specifically um, are a source of paranoia in terms of being corrupters of society. Yes, okay. Well, that's a really good question. I mean, that sort of question really, I think, should be addressed by a comparative historian or a social anthropologist because I've been very reliant upon the research of social historians and anthropologists. But with that proviso in mind, I now feel entitled to <laughs> expand. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, well, I think what what uh, so what Thomas says in the English context is that um, uh, basically many of the people who were asking for help were poor old women, um, and uh, so that was so the the it, not always women, sometimes men, but they happened to be the poorest and most vulnerable people who would impose a persistent burden on the more prosperous members of the community to look after them. There's a limit to the amount of charity that people would extend. So actually, the, the other way of thinking about witchcraft accusations in that society is that they probably represent a, a subset of instances which point towards the fact that there are lots of very indigent people who are being looked after mm. most of the time, but there were occasions when that didn't happen and the person reacted to that. So Reginald Scott, I think, he's wrote in The Discovery of the Witch. So Keith Thomas says that he describes these old ladies, old women, as miserable wretches who, in many ways, the reputation of witchcraft was one of the ways, it was a weapon of the weak, it was one of the ways in which they were able to um, enlist the help of other people because people would be frightened of not giving them basic resources because they would be afraid of the consequence of witchcraft. So sometimes this would be cultivated, this reputation, but it could backfire, of course. Um, so, but I think if you want to, and then, you know, there's lots of ethnography about who has witchcraft and whether it's, it's kind of, whether you're a healer or whether you're a witch. Mm. And the healers are often feared because they've got the power. So you don't want to fall out with a healer because what allows them to heal witchcraft 
also allows them to do witchcraft as well. And so you get debates about is there kind of good witchcraft and bad witchcraft. And in societies where sort of, you know, male chieftainship or headship, these people are very powerful people. They've got lots of witchcraft at their disposal, and it's a way of accounting for their power. Um, and, the, and they will also cultivate that. So, it, 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 so it's all, I mean, it's variable. It varies with society and context, but there are lots of notions there about people um, enlisting uh, these ideas as part of reputation enhancement in some situations uh, as a way of wielding social influence. Uh, but actually not necessarily in a way that they're inventing it, because people also can be invested in the ideas. They can really believe. Many people really believe. So uh, I'm sure that many of those old ladies who were affronted by being rebuffed uh, and when they were cursing, you know, wishing evil on the household, uh, they probably, many of them, were probably very angry and upset and actually felt they were being wronged and whatever they were wishing on upon the people who deserved. But it seems like in your explanation, the women you mentioned are wretched and therefore lower down the social economic hierarchy. Yeah. But for them to be a source of paranoia, they have to be invested with a certain power and they have magical powers often then. I wonder so where Thomas, they So Thomas's explanation is, is you could view it as a sort of almost a psychodynamic type of explanation mm. that the um, that the people who are making the witchcraft accusations are doing so to mitigate a sense of guilt about <coughs> turning away a needy old woman. Um, and so the fact, you know, you turn away the needy old woman. So it's very interesting, actually, the fear. So one of the examples that uh, Thomas gives is of a, there's a dispute between an old woman who comes to the door and the lady of the house and she says to her if, if any miscarry in this house thou shalt answer for it so it's a kind of a, it's a view of the, the, you know, the powers of, of this old woman um, that posing to the household like causing miscarriages amongst the women of the household so it's this idea that um, misfortune it's Thomas' explanation, unexplained misfortune is attributed to personal causation and it occurs in the context of... And so this comes across, actually, that the witch finder in different settings basically, and, you know, the ethnographers say this and uh, the social historians say this, that the person who has the job of identifying the witch more or less co coaxes out of the person who consults the witch finder, who, who they suspect of, uh, of harming them of causing the misfortune. And almost always, it's clearly known beforehand who they have in mind. So it's occurring in the context of a social conflict where strong emotions are aroused and something has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. What about the, you know, the, the, the uh, female sexuality? Um, Go on, Nick. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it's a classic, classic <laughs> trope of male-dominated Western society is that you know, there's both a fascination and a fear of untrammeled female sexuality and a, you know, a desire to kind of keep, you know, keep it under control and keep it proper and all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. male sexuality as well, for that matter. Um, okay. Yeah, all, all that stuff. And, you know, the, like the images of the witches copulating with the devil, mm -hmm. this idea of this sort of licentious, untrammeled female sexuality, which is evil because it is kind of licentious and untrammeled, and, and that's a very bad thing, and, you know, to sort of, you know, you know, classic sort of... Christian ideas of, of the, the sinful nature of, of sexuality, which tends to get much more kind of projected into women than, than it does in, into men. And then also, you're talking specifically about old women, there's also the fear of the, the old, you know, mm. um, you know, yeah, dying, the fear of death, the fear of mortality. Also, that fear that maybe old people actually, because they're older, they, they, maybe they are wise, and maybe they do know something that you don't, you know, maybe mm. they do have powers in a, in a sense, knowledge, let's say, that, that, that you don't. I mean, I think all those things must be must be feeding into. Yes, no. There's a whole. There's a obviously there's a very big literature um, about this. I mean, it's it's actually it's actually also what conceptual resources people draw on to interpret their own sexual fantasies and urges uh, in different societies, uh, particularly in a society which is extremely repressive attitudes towards sexuality. So, kind of a, you know spontaneous sexual ideas or attractions and so on, it, 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 violating um, religious norms, um, invite interpretation as temptation. 
and, it, and uh, or equally, so you, you you might be a hapless victim of the temptation of the devil, or alternatively, you might uh, kind of collude with it and give into it. And so you can see the seeding of all sorts of ideas, which then, and of course, the theologians and the church take a great interest in this. Um, partly because it has to do with the <coughs> boundaries of human nature which they're controlling and uh, kind of policing in some sense or regulating, uh, but also because it feeds into the confirmation of their view of the world. So, I mean, but again, I would emphasize, I mean, I, you know, I think this is very much the province of social historians, really, and ethnographers. Yeah, but, I mean, for example, the word glamour, you know, to cast a glamour on someone was to bewitch them. Um, you know, to put a spell on them or something like that. Whereas now, you know, that word has morphed in, in meaning that it now denotes, you know, something to do with you know, the erotic or the, the sexually alluring. I mean, mm. the link is right there in the, in yes. the language. Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know about any, um, how what the figures are for it, but I, my general impression is that the which doctors and African societies, I don't know, you know what, uh, are, are more often male than female. So you've got the, you have the female here in Western society, this traditional you know, old lady, mm. but it seems to be more of a, a, a powerful, it, it, the way it presents itself in, in those cultures. Yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't have enough comparative knowledge to comment on that. But it, it, I mean, it, 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 if you, I mean, the problem here actually is that, is that there isn't there's a, there is a reluctance amongst anthropologists to do comparative anthropology because as a discipline it's very focused on understanding particular societies and and it's been sort of, there's been a reluctance to do it. social historians are much more ready to do that than anthropologists are. Um, but so that, but there are some comparative ethnographies. So Peter Gachier's book is one of them. Um, but so even if you so you can find collections so there's a, a collection from 1970 um, was edited by Mary seventeen edited by Mary Douglas who's a famous collection of essays about witchcraft and there are plenty of anthropologists who many of whom work in Africa and always in Africa describing descriptions within particular societies of the, of the you know social structure uh, but these were not comparative essays. These were these were kind of small monograph type essays, uh, and and therefore the, the discipline itself actually is conduced against generalisation. Um, but there are some exceptions to that. Oh, the, oh, there's another just another point, slightly off it. The, the, the methods of collecting, or I don't know, I do use a colloquial expression, sussing out information about somebody. Uh, that you can use, then you can look as if you deduce what's going on. Um, I think that's a, that's a sort of classic way that these successful psychics work. Yes. They, yeah. that they you know, elicit information which is then you know, suddenly produced as useful. Yeah. Yes, I wouldn't dispute that. Well, look, we've been going for two hours. You've been on your feet continuously. <laughs> Maybe uh, this is the point to, to finish, but should we just um, end by thanking Quentin for... for <laughs>